By this, we know. This is really going to be a major theme of the balance of the book of 1 John because the whole book, as we just saw in our theme verse, chapter 5, verse 13, John says, these things have been written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may, what? That you may know that you have eternal life. And if you are wondering, how can I know for a fact that I am saved? Watch this now. This is very important. Just look up here visually. You will never be able to have knowledge of salvation by looking at anything out in the world. You will only have a true, genuine knowledge of salvation, both how to be saved and how to know that you have been saved, look here, by these things. Not by examining some past memory. Not by looking at something that was written down in the front of your Bible or in a prayer journal. But if you're going to look in your Bible, don't look at something that your mom or your dad or that you wrote down in the front. Look at the things that the apostles and prophets wrote from the book of Genesis all the way through the end of the book of the Revelation. John says these things will help you have a knowledge of salvation. And this is one of the primary things that he gives right here in this text. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him. Now again, just by way of continued introduction, I want to submit to you this morning and this week, there is no greater knowledge than knowing how to be saved. Because there's no greater need that a person has than the need of salvation and the forgiveness of sin, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. So there is no greater knowledge, all the mathematical knowledge, scientific knowledge, historical knowledge, there is no greater knowledge knowledge than to know how to be saved. Jesus put it this way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, to know everything that could possibly be known in this world? What would it profit or benefit a man if you had the biggest house, the fanciest vehicles, and the nicest clothes that impress everybody? Of what use would that be to you if you live 75, 80, even 90 years and impress everybody in this world? You die lost and spend eternity separated from God. Be absolutely of no use to you. So, so there's no greater knowledge in this world than the knowledge of how to be saved. But I would say in a very close second, no greater knowledge other than knowing how to be saved than to know that you have been saved. You may ask this morning, how can I know for a fact that I have been saved? Well, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, I want to encourage each of you to take out your pen and your camp notebook And I want you to jot down the outline and the other statements that will be on the screen. And by the way, as we're preparing for this lesson here at the beginning of the week, one of the greatest ways that you can show maturity is to sit up straight, pay attention, take notes, and listen carefully. Later in the week especially, if your neighbor in the seat begins to nod off, you will be a true friend to them To just give them a little elbow or a little nudge and make sure that they stay awake and engaged. And secondly, especially in the evening services, I want to encourage you. You will show maturity, hospitality, kindness, honor, and respect to our guest speakers if you're sitting up straight and obviously paying attention. God is blessing us this week with some incredible preachers and teachers of God's Word. And we gave them an assignment of a text to preach on. So they're, for you adults, they're, they're not coming and just re-preaching something they preached a year ago at their church. They have spent time preparing the evening messages to pour into your heart. And you show honor and dignity and respect to our guest speakers, as I know you will, by paying attention and taking notes. And let's start with that practice this morning because you'll see the first point up on the screen and I want you to put it down in your notebook. I want you to consider with me a definitive test. A definitive test. That is, here is a definite test. By this we know. In fact, John says that twice in these four verses. By this we know that we have come to know him. I was recently watching a cable television show, actually watching it on 
YouTube and there was a man that had gone to a pawn shop trying to sell what he claimed to be this huge block of silver. The guy in the pawn shop, they deal a lot with the buying and selling of gold and silver and so he knew that fake silver or plated silver, that's a, that's a really big scam. A lot of times people will take blocks of lead or other just cheap metal and they'll cover it in silver and try to take it somewhere and sell it as if it's a big block of silver. And so there were some tests that that man knew how to, how to utilize to test whether that silver was real. And I learned on that show and confirmed later on the internet that there are as many as 12 different tests to determine if something is really silver. Some of you ladies, maybe even some of you guys have some jewelry that is pure silver or even sterling silver. Some of you ladies here, some of your students, some of your mothers may even have some, some uh, pots and things they use when company comes over that may be plated silver. It's a cheap metal that's kind of covered up in silver. And the, 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 the reality is there are 12 different tests that you can use to determine if something is real silver or fake silver. For example, some are uh, use acid. If you put nitric acid on silver, it turns white. If, if you put nitric acid on fake silver, it turns green. If you put citric acid on real silver, it turns red. If you put it on fake silver, it turns blue. Now, you may not know this, but real silver is not magnetic. So if you put a magnet on it and it slides off, that will be a telltale sign. Bleach turns real silver black. It causes it to immediately tarnish. Real silver has a ring to it. That's why a lot of bells, commemorative bells, are made out of real silver. Real silver conducts heat very quickly. So if you took some, some cheap metal and some real silver and put an ice cube on each one, the ice cube on the real silver will melt more quickly. Now, and again, it is said that there are over 12 different tests to determine the genuineness of silver, and any one of them is absolutely definitive. Watch this now. The silver doesn't have to pass all 12 tests. Any one of them is definitive by itself. In the book of 1 John, we're going to see this week, there are as many as 9 or 10 different tests, depending on how Bible commentators kind of count them up and sometimes they're sort of lumped together but there are nine or ten different tests to say this is how you can know for a fact that you've truly been born again and listen to me students and any single one of them will stand on its own this is not a matter of saying well I I think I passed five out of six or nine out of ten or brother Mike I don't think I'm doing real well on the one you're talking about today but I'll see if I pass the one tonight no, any single one of these is a definitive test. It doesn't matter how many of the others you've got going for you. If you fail this one, the Bible says you have no reason to know or believe that you've truly been born again. Now, as we examine the definitive test in these verses, I want to quickly point out three things. First, write down this word, the clarification. That is, I want to give clarity. I want to be clear what this passage, what these verses, and quite frankly, what this whole book is talking about. Because if you don't understand this clarification, you're going to be as confused as a termite inside a wooden yo-yo when it comes to the knowledge of your own salvation. This verse is not saying that by this we come to know him. This verse does not say by this we come to be saved. Because what we're talking about this morning are the keeping of the commandments. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, by keeping the commandments, you come to know God. The Bible actually says exactly the opposite. So as we talk in the next few moments about commandment keeping, I need to be crystal clear. This is not telling you that you become a Christian 
by keeping the commandments of God. This passage, this book is not about how to be saved. It's about how to know that you have been saved. And if you don't get that clear and plain in your mind, you're going to be very confused. For example, one of the tests yesterday that Pastor Chad taught us about, one test of genuine salvation is there is an awareness of sin in your life. There's a conviction of sin. There is a knowledge of sin. But you can be aware of sin and not be saved. I've seen that in the lives of students and adults my entire life and my whole ministry. They're lost in their sin. You share the gospel with them. They will begin. Their eyes will tear up. Their lip may begin to tremble. They will acknowledge they are a sinner on their way to hell. You ask them, is there anything that would keep you from receiving Christ as Lord and Savior? And they'll say, not today. I'm just not ready. So it's possible to have an awareness of sin and not be saved, but it is not possible to be saved and not have an awareness of sin. Last night we also talked about the confession of sin. It's possible to go around and verbally say, oh, I know that I have sinned and not be saved. But it is not possible to be saved and never confess your sin. So much so that in chapter 1 we learn that if we say we have no sin, if there's no confession of sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Later this week, we're going to learn another definitive test of salvation is if you have a love for your brothers, a love for your fellow man. What I want you to see is it's possible to love other people and not be saved, but it's not possible to be saved and have an unrepented of, unconvicted over hatred for other people. Later this week, we will talk about another definitive test. That is a knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. You've got to know who Jesus is. The clarification is this. Look right here and pay very close attention. It's possible to know who Jesus is and not be saved. But it is not possible to be saved without knowing who Jesus is. That was a major part of Pastor Chad's lesson yesterday morning. Here in these verses, we're talking about commandment keeping. And I need you to put this in your mind very straight because, listen, students, what I'm about to tell you in the next 60 seconds separates biblical Christianity from every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world, including some religions that call themselves Christianity, will tell you the things you have to do in order to be saved. Christianity, however, says there is nothing that you can do because you're not good enough and you'll never be good enough. But Jesus died on the cross and declared it is finished, it is accomplished, it is done. Everything necessary for you to be saved is done not by you, it's done by the living Lord Jesus Christ. So as we talk about the keeping of commandments, please understand this clarification. Keeping the commandments is not how you are saved. But keeping the commandments is a way that you can know that you have been saved. Jot down a reference to Romans 3 verse 28. You see the reference on the screen. In Romans 3.28, the Apostle Paul is talking about the doctrine of justification, which we're going to really dig down into tomorrow morning. And he says, for we maintain, in other words, we don't apologize for this. This is the Bible truth. We maintain that a man is justified by faith. For our purpose today, just think of saved by faith. That a man is saved or justified by faith apart from the works of the law. No person has ever been saved by keeping the commandments of God, but no person, listen, who is unconcerned about keeping the commandments of God has any reason to believe that they are saved. For by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now, as we think about this definitive test, we look at the clarification, but I want to say a word also about the context. Write that word down in your notes, the context. Now, what we mean by context is 
where this verse appears, where this section appears in the overall scope of Scripture. One of the most dangerous ways, young people, to study the Bible is to just open it up and look at one verse without giving any attention to the verses that appear before it or the verses that appear after it. Now let me just remind you where we were last night. In Pastor Chad Campbell's wonderful sermon, and I'd encourage you to find it on our podcast, go back and listen to these messages again and again and again and let it, let it drill down deep into the soil of your heart that we have to confess that we have sinned. Even as Christians, we still deal with our sin nature and we confess our sins. And when we come to chapter 2, the writer reminds us that when we do sin, we have an advocate that is sort of like a defense attorney, somebody who will plead our case for us. We have an advocate with the Father. Listen to who he is. Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, right about here, I can just imagine that John is a little concerned that knowing that Jesus is our advocate when we sin might cause some of his readers to be a little slack when it comes to their own personal obedience. Here's what I mean. I want you to imagine for just a moment that your daddy is the chief of police and you just started driving and somebody says, you better slow down, you're going to get a speeding ticket. You might have a tendency to say, well, I'm not worried about a speeding ticket. My daddy's the police chief. I've got somebody who's in a high position that'll take care of this for me. And for that reason, I'm not real worried about obedience. Or maybe your mom or dad is a principal or works at the county board of education. And so that can cause people not as smart as you to think, well, I don't really have to obey my teacher. I don't have to obey my coach. I don't have to get permission to be here or be there because my mom or my daddy will take care of it. And, and if you have that kind of immature attitude toward who it is that can intervene for you, it can cause you to not be concerned about obedience. And so John seems to say, Don't think that just because you've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who will plead your case, and he will win that case, by the way. But but don't think that that means that you don't have to be concerned about obeying the commandments, keeping the commandments of God. So the context here is flowing from the fact we have an advocate with the Father God, our Father, is the judge. Our big brother, Jesus, is our defense attorney. But that doesn't mean that we should not be concerned about keeping the commandments of God. David Guzik, in his commentary, the Enduring Word commentary, and if you're ever doing Bible study online, I would commend to you the Enduring Word commentary. And David Guzik writes that we have a gracious advocate in heaven. We have an open invitation to restoration through confession. And students, that is wonderful news that when we have sinned, we can boldly approach the throne of God, knowing that God in His grace and mercy will forgive us of our sins. And as 1.9 says, He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Guzik writes that these things do not make the converted man careless about the commandments. And here's why. God changes the heart at conversion And writes his law upon our heart. So being saved does not mean we can suddenly be unconcerned about the commandments of God. Students, when you get saved, that's the first moment in your life that you really are concerned about the commandments of God. Because the laws of God are no longer merely written in ink in a dusty book on your bookshelf. But when you are converted... When you are regenerated, we'll talk about that in a moment. When you are saved, the Bible says the law of God is now written upon our hearts. And we become concerned for the first time about keeping the commandments of God. The clarification, the context, let me quickly now say a word about the conversion. Why is it, verse 4, the one who says I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Why is that true? 
It's because you've been converted. Now, who can tell me just real quickly a synonym for the word convert? What, what does the word convert mean? Do you know? Change. When you've been converted, you've been changed. If you've ever traveled to a foreign country, you know, sometimes you have to take a converter for, for those wall sockets for electricity because in other countries they don't use the same type of electrical system that, that we use here in the United States. And you, you've got to change that kind of power into another kind of power so you plug a converter into the wall. To convert means to change. Now I want you to imagine with me for just a moment, silly little illustration... Silly little illustration, but imagine for just a moment that I, Pastor Mike, had the ability to change one kind of animal into another kind of animal. And imagine that I had claimed to have the ability to change a, a bird into a fish. What would be one of the telltale signs that that bird had actually been converted into a fish? Well, it would be able to live underwater now. Birds don't live and breathe underwater. So one of the definitive tests that the change had occurred is that a change has occurred. Now I know that sounds simple, but let me say it again. One of the telltale signs, the definitive test that a conversion has taken place that a change has taken place. One of the best ways to know a change has taken place is that you see that a change has taken place. And that's really what John is saying now as we move into verse 4. The one who says, I've come to know him and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I might, re, I might re paraphrase it like this. The one who says, I've been changed but hasn't been changed has not been changed. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. And when somebody protests and say, oh, I don't know about that, he says, the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. That's a definitive test. And there's a second truth I want you to notice. And this really sets the stage for the entire week. What I've labeled a deceptive talk. Now again, this will be a recurring theme of 1 John. Is the difference between what you say and what you do. How you talk and how you walk. What you say with your mouth and how you live with your life. In fact, with your Bible open to 1 John, I want to show you this recurring theme in a number of different places. Look back in chapter 1 and verse 6. If we, what, verse, chapter 1, verse 6, if we, what, if we say we have fellowship with him and yet, what, walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. If we, what, say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. Look down at verse 10. What are the first three words? If we say that we have not sinned. We make him a liar and his word is not in us. Go down to chapter 2 and verse 9. 1 John 2, 9. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. You get the, impl you get the idea here that John is saying, I don't care if you say that you're walking in the light. If you're actually living a life of hatred to your fellow man, it doesn't matter what you say. I can tell by what you're doing. You're not walking in the light you claim to be walking in. Go over to chapter 4 and verse 20. I just want to show you that this is going to be a recurring theme, the difference in what we say and what we do. Are you looking at 420? If someone, what? Says, I love God. And hates his brother, he is a liar. I think it was last night that Pastor Chad quoted this old song that says, Your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Did I say that right? That's kind of a tongue twister. You ought to try to 
memorize that, but don't try to say it 10 times fast. You may have something come out of your mouth you didn't intend to. <laughs> this is a deceptive talk as we go back to chapter 2 and verse 4. The one who says, we can talk it by the mile. They say, I've come to know him. What would that sound like to us? I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved. I've been baptized. I got saved at student camp three years ago. I, I got saved at vacation Bible school at my granny's church in the fifth grade. I, the one who says that I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now, as we think about this deceptive talk that might even just be a matter that you are self-deceived. It may not be that you know that you're lost and you're just trying to impress everybody. You may be lying to yourself. And so that's one reason this book has been written. So you don't even take your own word about yourself. We need to take God's word about ourselves. Now, as we think about this deceptive talk, let me just tell you three things about it. First of all, it's good, but it's insufficient. Now the word insufficient, if you don't know what that means, it just means it's not enough. It's like going to the store with 50 cents and thinking you're going to buy a drink that costs $2. Nothing wrong with the 50 cent. It's just not enough to purchase that drink. Now the reason I say it's good but it's insufficient is look at what he says in verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him. There's nothing wrong with saying, I have come to know him. In fact, that's a wonderful thing to say. Anyone who has indeed come to know the Lord ought to be willing to say, I have come to know him. To boldly, publicly, and unapologetically declare, Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. But jot down a reference to Luke 6, 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. One of the... Places in the Bible where Jesus addresses saying versus doing. Listen to what he said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you don't do what I say to do. One of the passages that we looked at yesterday morning in Matthew 7 verse 21 and following. In fact, look up to the screen. I want you to read it. <clears throat> Read it as I read, you read silently as I read aloud. This is Jesus talking about judgment day. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. Now, now look, look right here. Here's my point. It is a good thing to recognize Jesus as Lord. To call him Lord because that's who and what he is. In fact, the scripture teaches in Romans 10, 13 that whosoever shall call not on the name of the Savior, but whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts 16, 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So there's nothing wrong, I'm saying it's good but insufficient, nothing wrong with calling Jesus Lord, much right with calling Jesus Lord, but there'll be plenty of people on judgment day that call Jesus Lord, Lord, but he said, not everybody that says that shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what's the next word, but he that, read it aloud, but he that doeth, it's not the person that can talk it but the person who has demonstrated that their faith is sincere. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Go to the next verse. Many will, many will what? Say to me in that day. Here it is again. Lord, Lord. That's a wonderful thing to say. And look at what they're going to testify to verbally. Have we not prophesied in your name? Prophecy means preaching. We preach sermons. We taught Sunday school. I, we, I, I pastored a church. And in thy name we cast out devils. And in thy name we've done many wonderful works. That's a, hey, listen, students, that's an impressive list. This is what they're saying they did. 
But look at the very next verse. And then I, Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know what the word iniquity means? Wicked, sinful, vile stuff. Now think about this. What is it that they said they had done? Listen, girls, what is it that they said they had done? Preached, cast out devils, performed miracles. That's a whole lot better than just going to church, being at student camp, adults volunteering at student camp. That's good, but it don't rival prophesying and casting out devils and performing mighty miracles. But Jesus said, because you didn't actually have a personal relationship with me, because I never knew you, all of that was a work of iniquity. Jesus saw it all as an act of sin, self-sufficiency, and pride. And I want you to notice, because we're talking about a deceptive talk. Jesus contrasts what they are going to say about him. They will say, Lord, Lord. He says to them, I don't know who you're talking about. So students, listen very carefully. On judgment day, it won't matter as much what you say about Jesus. But what does Jesus say about you? It's a good thing to call him Lord. But it's insufficient. It's not enough just to talk it. It's good, but it's insufficient. Secondly, write this truth down. It's great, but it's irrelevant. Now, the word irrelevant just means it doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. Saying that you have come to know him, we're back in chapter 2 and verse 4, the one who says I have come to know him, saying that is a good thing. It's a great thing, but it's not addressing The question. For example, if I were to ask you, or if you were to ask me, Pastor, what time is lunch today? And if I said blue is my favorite color, (laughs) you say, Well, that's nice to know. Interesting information. Doesn't answer the question that I asked. Or how much is a gallon of gas these days, Pastor? And I say, well, I'll, I'll be married 27 years on the 15th of next month. Well, that's good. But it doesn't have anything to do with the question that was asked. How about this? Do you think you're a Christian? Why are you asking, Pastor? I told you that I was. I said that I was. That's great, but it doesn't answer the question. In fact, throughout this book, as we've already indicated, a book that is written to tell you how that you can know that you're saved, John is constantly and repeatedly putting down, basing your knowledge of your own salvation on anything that you have merely said with your mouth. So what we find here is that if someone says they've come to know the Lord, but they're not keeping his commandments, that what they're saying is good, but it's irrelevant to the question. Now I want to show you a little video clip from a classic sitcom called The Andy Griffith Show. Y'all familiar with The Andy Griffith Show? Barney and Andy and Opie. Well, in this particular scene, there's a guy in town, he works at the filling station. That is, he worked at a place where they used to put gas in your car and take care of your cars and keep your cars maintained. And his name is Gomer. And uh, Andy and Barney are wanting to take their girlfriends to a dance on that Saturday night. But the problem is, one of their girlfriends has a cousin that's in town. And so they've said, we're We're not going to go to the dance with you and leave my cousin at home. We've got company for the weekend. So we'll only go to the dance if y'all can find a date to take my cousin to the dance. All right? Her name is Mary Grace. Now, you don't see her in this clip. But let's just say um, she has the kind of face that would make a train take a dirt road. (laughs) 
They call it a blind date for a reason because only a blind man would really be interested in taking Mary Grace. Okay, look, I could have taken a long time to say that a lot nicer, but, but my time's running out, all right? Let's watch what happens in this clip. No, no, we got to get some guy that's not been around too much. Yeah. You know, really naive. <laughs> some guy with not too much upstairs. Yeah. In other words, a real dope. Hey, Andy, hey, Barney. <laughs> there you go. There you go. A little squat car. Grease your transmission, your differential. Give her a good wash, too. Not the transmission and differential. That don't get washed. That just gets grease. <laughs> Gomer, have you given much thought to the Chamber of Commerce dance Saturday night? No, can't say the hell. Well, how would you like to come along with us in the company of a young lady? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got one for you. Just dying to go to the dance, but don't know anybody here. You know, a stranger in town. That's right. Well, I don't know. What's she like? Just as nice a girl as you'll nice, ever want to meet. Nice girl. <laughs> Heard nice. And, and she's so sweet and kind and just as smart as a whip, ain't she? Oh, she's smart. Is she pretty? And she's so nice. <laughs> well, what does she look like? Uh, well, uh... You know Barney's girl, Thelma Lou. Oh, sure. Well, do we have to say more? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? She's Thelma Lou's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And she's so nice. <laughs> well... We'll have a lot of fun, Gomer. What do you say, go? Okay. That's a time. <laughs> well, thank y'all for asking oh, me. Don't mention it. Well, I guess I'd best be getting back to work. Okay. <laughs> See you Saturday. Saturday. And you say she's nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you get the idea. He wants to know what does she look like, and they keep talking about how nice she is. Well, later in the show, it becomes obvious she really is nice. She's a very sweet lady. But that was just never answering the question that Gomer was asking. And the reason I show you that by itself, that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about except this. If you're even asking yourself, do I know that I'm saved? If all you have to base that on is how, what you say, what you're saying may be good. It may be right and true. But it doesn't have anything to do with the question that's been asked. By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. And the one who says that I've come to know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Him. So it's good, but it's insufficient. That kind of talk is great, but it's irrelevant. Write this down. It's godly, but it's inconclusive. All true believers are willing to verbally profess their faith. Jesus said that whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever is ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of him before my Father who is in heaven. When a person says they are saved, that's a good, great, and godly thing to say, but it's insufficient, it's irrelevant, and it's inconclusive. In fact, I want you to all repeat these three words after me. I am saved. I am saved. Say it again. I am saved. Now, do you know what it means that every person in this room just said I am saved. Do you know what that means? It means that every person in this room just said, I am saved. But that's all that it means. It doesn't necessarily mean any more than that. Real quickly, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles back to the left. Turn back five or three books to the book of James. If you get to Hebrews, you went too far. Turn back a few books to the book of James, and I want you to look at chapter 2. James chapter 2, 
is one of the preeminent chapters in the Bible dealing with the relationship between what we say and what we do. James 2, I want to begin reading in verse 14. If you have James 2, 14, say, I've got it. What use is it, my brethren, if someone, what? Says he has faith, but he has no works. Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you, what? Says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well, what? Say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Well, you do well. In other words, you say, I believe in God. He says, great. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder, they tremble. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow... That faith without works is useless. Verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So what we have here is we turn back now to 1 John chapter 2. There is a definitive test. By this we know that we've come to know him. There is a deceptive talk, the one who says I've come to know him but does not keep his commandments as a liar, and the truth is not in him. Thirdly, and quickly for the morning, a demonstrative truth. I'm talking about how the truth of salvation is demonstrated practically in the lives that we live. Now, as we go through the book of 1 John, you're going to see that some of the tests are private and personal. They deal with the motives and the thoughts and intentions of the heart and they can't really be seen by other people. For example, chapter 1 deals with whether you're convicted over your sin and whether you confess it to God. That is something that in many ways, depending on what the sin was, could be something that's very private and personal, known only between you and God. We'll deal later with the love for other people and again... That's something that can just be hidden in the heart and never known to anyone else. But the test that we see here in these verses is something that is very public. You either keep the commandments of God or you don't. You either cuss when you get mad or you don't. And if you do, other people hear it. You either lie to your parents or you don't and when you lie somebody hears it you either keep the commandments of God in terms of church attendance and faithfulness to the things of God and that's something that is observable to everyone around you so the truth of this test is something that can be demonstrated there are three things I want you to notice about this before we head to our team time the first and this is so very important I've labeled the personal reverence. Reverence means respect, a fear, and honor. And notice what the text says as we just continue. Remember, we're moving verse by verse this week through this book. Verse 5, but, so we've talked about the liar, somebody who talks it, but they don't live it. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word in him or her, the love of God has truly been perfected. And by this we know that we are in him. He's talking about keeping the commandments. Would you say the word keep? The word keep here is a very important word in the Greek of the New Testament. We would pronounce it tareo. Tareo. And it does not mean, listen carefully, it does not mean to obey. It means to watch, to observe, to look at, and to study. This word watch, keep as watch, is used in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas are in jail and a guard was assigned to keep the prisoners, to to watch them, to guard them. 
them. This is the same word Jesus used in John 14, 15 when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now we even have phrases that we use in our vernacular and and the way that we talk to describe that when we're looking at something, when we're watching something, when we're keeping an eye on something, we're really talking about how we've been studying and examining and observing something. For example, I may say to one of you young men this week, I've I've been watching you, and God's doing a great work in your life. Or you may have a parent or an adult, maybe a Sunday school teacher, who loves you enough to say, "I've I've been watching some things in your life. And I want to correct you about some things. I've been watching. I've been been keeping my eye on you. I've been studying and observing and watching. And I've noticed some things that are not honoring the Lord. And by the way, if you've got people in your life that love you enough to do that, you are blessed. Blessed by God. And listen to me. Sometimes the best source that that can come from is one of your friends. You see, you're at a stage in your life that a peer, a guy in your class, a girl in your class that speaks truth into your life sometimes has more of an effect than even your mom or your dad or your Sunday school teacher or your preacher. So you ought to take responsibility if you see something going on in the life of another student, somebody that you're close to, take the word of God and love them enough to confront them. What this word keep means, this is so very important, it means more than just a glance. It doesn't mean you just look at it and look away. It means you're keeping your eye on it. You're studying it. And students, look right up here. Pay close attention to what pastor is teaching you this morning. This verse is not saying that you can know that you are saved if you always keep the commandments of God. We just dealt with that yesterday in chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But, But watch this. When a person is genuinely saved and you can have a knowledge of your salvation if you live your life watching and observing and studying and trying your best to keep the commandments of God. You're keeping your eye on it. And so you're walking through life keeping your eye on the standard of the Word of God. And because of that, when you step outside of the will of God, outside of the way of God, outside of the Word of God, you notice that too. Why? Because you've been keeping your eye on the standard. By contrast, someone who just says that I came to know him, they don't keep their eye on the word of God. It's as if the Bible is something they stuck off over to the side and they're living over here with no concern, no love for, no no, no consideration, no reverence for the Word of God. And when somebody says, hey, what what about the Bible? What about the truth of God that you say you have come to know? They say, oh, that? Oh, I did that. Back in the second grade, I did that. If that's your your life, You have no reason to have any assurance of salvation. But I tell you, one of the telltale signs of somebody that's truly been born again, and John says, if what I'm about to describe sounds like you, you can can have a knowledge that I know Christ as Lord and Savior. If you live your life like this, not perfectly, because we're all going to continue to sin and fall short of the glory of God. But because I've got the standard of the scripture in front of me and a desire in my heart to obey it, when I disobey it, I notice it. It bothers me. It convicts me. And I try to get back up under submission to it as quickly and fully as I possibly can. So so this truth is demonstrated with a personal Reverence. Real quickly, look at the proper remedy. The proper remedy. 
still in verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now I'm going to wrap this up real quickly. I want you to imagine, here, imagine here's a student or here's an adult and on this side is their talk. Man, they talk up a storm. Say they love Jesus, say that they're saved, but their walk is way over here. You see, that's not even. Let me tell you what a lot of people do. They say, well, since I'm not living it, I'm just going to quit talking about it. I'm just going to give in. This is a time in my life I'm young. I'll get serious about the things of God later. Well, first of all, you may not live till later. Secondly, you may do some stupid stuff that so messes up your life that by the time you get to later, you've got such a mess in your life, you can't unscramble that egg. What I'm saying is if, if your talk is up here and your walk is down here, the proper remedy, John does not say, stop talking. What he says, don't, don't lower your talk to match your walk. He says if you talk about God is up here, if you're genuinely saved, the proper remedy is get your walk up here. Matching your talk. The one who says I've come to know him ought to walk in the same manner as he, Jesus, walked. That's the proper remedy. Thirdly and finally, the practical revelation. But verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner As Christ walked. So if a person says they are saved, there is a practical way that you can know that your own testimony is true. And it's not by going to camp, although I'm grateful you're here. It's not by singing in the student choir, though I wish each of you would. It's not by going on a mission trip or carrying a Bible in your backpack to school, wearing a Christian t-shirt or a youth group t-shirt to school, It's not by putting John 3.16 in the eye black if you're an athlete. It's not by stamping Philippians 4.13 on everything that you do or signing John 3.16 under your name when you sign other people's yearbook. The way that you can know that you're saved is examine your life. Do I have a desire and a discipline to keep the commandments of God? Let's bow in prayer together. Students, workers, here at the beginning of the week, we have an opportunity to go ahead and do business with the Lord. There's no better time to do business with God than now. In part because now is the only time you know that you're actually going to have. But I want to encourage you to avoid the tendency to Well, we're going to wait until Wednesday night or Thursday night to get serious about God. That happens a lot at camps. That Thursday night, it's the last night and and the altar fills up. And oftentimes, if we're real honest, that's 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 an experience with camp. That's not an experience with, with Jesus. If the Lord has spoken to your heart today, why don't you do business with him now? And it may be that he has revealed to you that despite any past decision or commitment you joined the church said you were saved got baptized you realize in light of this test you've never truly been saved and I would ask you where you are right now if the spirit of God is dealing with your heart receive Jesus as Savior and Lord could very well be that God has used this message in the heart of someone who is genuinely saved to just point out some sin issue in your life and I Students, I tried to not give a very long list of specific things. But the Holy Spirit may have put his finger on some issue in your life. And your need today is not to be saved, because if you already are, you can't be saved again. But you just need to confess those sins and get right with the Lord.